Welcome, welcome to a brand new episode of Identity Talk for Educators Live. I'm your host, Kwame Safo Mensa. And if this is your first time tuning in to the podcast, we welcome you and we hope that you return for future episodes. And if you're someone that's returning, I'm hoping that you brought a friend to tune in and you tell them to subscribe to this podcast. And we're all over Apple Podcast, Spotify, Anchor, and all other streaming platforms. But before we bring on our guest for this week, I want to just go over a few things very quickly. So the first thing is with Identity Talk, we're not just a podcast, but it's an actual firm where we do provide professional development to K-12 teachers all over the world. And we recently launched our virtual school, which you can find on Teachable. We currently have two courses that we're housing. The first is Shape to Teach Identity 101, which is all focused on all types of different aspects of teaching all around teacher identity. So we focus on culturally responsive teaching. We're focusing on anti-racist practices, uh, behavioral management, classroom management, family and parental engagement, and a host of other skills and concepts that you would typically learn in your traditional prep programs. And then our other course is called SPELL, which also stands for the Self-Publishing Educators Learning Lab for any teachers who are interested in becoming authors. And they have that book in their mind, that book on that Google Doc that they've been dying to get published, but just didn't have the courage to do it. We have a course for that as well. So if you're interested in any of those courses, you can book a call with us at Conley.com backslash Identity Talk for Educators. And then, of course, with the holiday season being here, we have some swag that we're going to be giving out to our teachers. And sales will be coming very soon at the apparel shop, which we have at Teesprings, as well as on our Instagram account. So if you are on Instagram, our handle is ID talk underscore apparel you could check out all the latest designs hoodies t-shirts tote bags all different accessories that we are showing off for the holiday season so check us out there and at the teespring shop at teesprings.com backslash stores backslash the identity talk apparel shop and then lastly with COVID 19 ravaging so many communities and so many schools. We've lost a number of teachers and some students to this pandemic. And as of November 12th, there were a total of 1,039,424 children who have contracted the virus, meaning they tested positive, which is way too high of a number. So in order to prioritize the safety of students, and to deprioritize standardized testing during COVID-19 as a safety measure, we're asked for people to sign the petition for Teachers for Good Trouble, donate to the cause, and amplify the message. And you can do that by visiting the website, which is teachersforgoodtrouble.org, or you can donate to the cause by going to that website as well. So we have a lot of things going on. So now that we've taken care of that, I'm just happy to bring on our guest for tonight. And who we have is somebody who is a great follow. When I first started using Instagram regularly, uh, a year and a half or two years back, uh, she was one of the first people who... I really started to follow on a regular basis because I just love her platform. I love what she's doing for, for black educators, you know, in that space and beyond. And she's somebody who is an educator by trade, but also an entrepreneur by nature. You know, she's a natural born hustler, also a self-care advocate for all. And I'm just excited to have her on the show. So without further ado, I want to bring Tashia Selden to the show to just talk to us about all the great work she's doing. So let's welcome her. 
Hello. Hey, how we doing? <laughs> I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing well, and it's an honor to have you on the podcast. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Yes. So how has the virtual learning experience been for your preschoolers? Because I know you have the little baby. So how's it been for them? Well, I'm in person. Oh, you're in person. Oh. So I've only had a virtual experience um, when I did teaching training in the summer. And that was horrible. So that's why I was like, I can only imagine how students are feeling. Because I was on the computer from June 15th to July 20th, Monday through Friday, every day. 8 30 to 5 30 p.m and then sometimes we had working lunches on the computer too like my eyes were irritated i was annoyed the whole time oh wow and i'm hoping that they're all safe there haven't been any any um cases um so far yeah no it's actually been okay um because like the preschool i teach at is on the campus of a hospital here so basically we service those families so like uh, i definitely understand the whole teachers for good trouble and everything like that but unfortunately like those families you know they don't have the option to not work so like i am grateful to be in a position to work at the school because it's literally on the campus of the hospital so we basically service those families and then, of course all the children wear masks besides the infants but my i have twos and threes so i have pre-k three and they're actually pretty good with their masks. And their parents, like, send them multiple masks a day so they know, like, to change their masks out if they get, like, too much flavor in there or something. And, like, they know, like, to only take it off when we eat lunch and, like, when it's nap time. So no issues so far. And, like, wow. they take a good check, you know, when they come in. And the parents are only allowed to bring the child in. They're not allowed to come to the classrooms um, or anywhere like that. Well, thank goodness, because safety is the number one issue, especially now. Um, I have a three-year-old who always reminds me, you know, Daddy, make sure you put your mask on. <laughs> so it's a part of the routine now when we're going to go out. Yeah. Like, make sure he checks myself. He checks my wife. <laughs> and it's just funny how it's become normalized for him. <laughs> yeah. Even one of my students, Elliot, and like, that's what they have favorite. He's like my favorite. He's so sweet. Like my mask like comes down. So it depends on like, cause I have like different masks based on my outfits. And like, I had this brown one on the other day and I love it. It's so cute, but it's like, it doesn't snug my face. So right. like it'll move down some and he like came over and like gave me a hug and then he like pulled it up. So <laughs> it like covered my nose and I was like, thank you, Elliot. <laughs> no, nah, for sure. But yeah, let's go right in because there's a lot that I need to learn from you because believe it or not, you know, I like to follow people who I believe are going to have a positive influence on me. You're definitely one of them. And I've been able to, you know, take a few things here and there, just, just watch how you move. But before we get into the business aspect and, and all the different things you have your hands in, I want, let's go back in time. Because okay. we know you're from Baltimore. Yes. <laughs> proud of it. <laughs> and I want to know a little bit about yourself and what ultimately brought you into the education field. So, okay, I was born and raised in Baltimore, which now when I talk to my friends in Colorado, they say, oh, you're starting to get your accent back. But I haven't lived home in nine years. So I was born and raised in Baltimore. I went to college in Florida. So my mom moved to Florida when I was a junior in high school. And I was like, mm, I don't want to go to a new state by going into my senior year of high school. And then she was like on the fence between Florida and Atlanta. So I applied to schools in Atlanta and Florida. And of course, like I only knew about like the major schools. So I only knew about like Clark Spellman and I applied to schools in Florida. She ended up staying in Florida. So I went to college there. I went to the Great Bethune Cookman University. I majored in criminal justice because the goal was to be a lawyer. Like when I was in high school, I had two internships at big law firms here in Baltimore. But I realized that I kind of was going to law school for all the wrong reasons. Like, unfortunately, <laughs> if you was to ask me, like, why do you want to be a lawyer? I was like, I want to be a lawyer to get my friends out of jail, <laughs> like straight up. And then like once I got more into it, I was like, why would I want to get you out of jail? Like you did this, you did that, you did that. And then of course I found out, you know, that there's other types of law. But then when I was in college, unfortunately my parents couldn't pay for me to go to school. I had four jobs in college. So I was like, 
if I don't really have the money and I don't really know if I want to do this, I don't think I should. So when it was time for me to graduate in 2015, I was like, well, what do you want to do? Because I was interning at the police department in the victim's advocacy. And I really enjoyed it because it was like helping the victims because I've always been like a people person, but they weren't hiring for my position. They were like, you know, you could go to cadet school and become a cop, but I never really wanted to be a cop. I thought of maybe becoming a detective, but you have to be a cop first. And ironically, like one of my mentors is a black cop in Baltimore. He's since retired, but I was like, I've still had, never had desires to be a cop. So when it was time to graduate, I was like, okay, so what do you want to do? So it was travel or work with children. So I applied to be a flight attendant and I applied for Teach for America. So I went on an interview in Boston, which is funny because you live in Boston. I went on an interview in Boston at a charter school. So I thought I was moving to Boston. But then I got a call August 15, 2015. Like I would never forget this date. August 15, 2015, Denver, Colorado. And I was like, where is that? Like I honestly had to like Google the map to figure out where Colorado was because I've never been beyond like Atlanta side of the map. So I was like, you know what, whatever. Like I was fresh out of college. I didn't have any children. I was like, you know, if I don't like it, I can always go back home. So I literally got my car shipped to Colorado. My dad was like, you know, I'm gonna ship your stuff from Baltimore there too because once I became a sophomore in college, I didn't go home again until the summertime because I lived in Florida. Like the weather was pretty decent. And in Daytona, you didn't really get affected that like that with the hurricane season either. So I really enjoyed it. So my first time experiencing winter again was when I went to Colorado. So I went there. Um, I started teaching there. And literally that school that I started teaching at, that was the school where I, like when I had my training, it was me and the nurse. And I was like, where are the people that look like me? But right. That was the, the start of it. So I don't want to go more into it because you're going to ask me another question. But yes, yeah, so that's how I started. And then I got an offer to get my master's um, originally at the University of Denver. So I started this uh, teaching program at University of Denver. But I only did the summer semester because I didn't really like that they had a stipulation on it. Right. So started the program and they covered half of your tuition because the University of Denver is 70K. So they covered 35K, but you have to commit to teaching for five years in Denver public schools for them to pay the rest off. And they show you like each year they pay like seven grand. And like, you know, while I did live there for like four and a half years, I was like, I don't want to have to like stay there because it's getting paid for. Like I wanted to be my choice. So I left and I started doing like small group tutoring. And then through that, I found out about Relay. And now with Relay, my scholarship covered the whole program. It was just a two-year program as opposed to a one-year program, but I didn't have to stay five years if I didn't want to. Wow. So you went from Baltimore to Denver. I mean, talk about a contrast um, <laughs> in, in cities. So I have to ask, because we know with Denver, you're dealing with a high altitude. Yeah. Did you ever get adjusted to the high altitude? I just I have that. Yeah, and it's funny because people always say like they get altitude sickness. And I do believe, like, I've had friends come and visit me when I was in Colorado, and I think they did, but it never affected me. All right. Okay, that's interesting. You're, you're probably the first person that said that. Because usually when folks talk about Denver, they just talk about how they just had a hard time just catching their breath, you yeah. know? just doing the simplest of tasks, whether it's walking or just walking up a story of stairs. They're huffing and puffing like they're out of shape. Well, it, if I went hiking now, it was a different story because hiking was even worse. Now, I would go hiking with my friends and I would be out of breath and we wouldn't even be going that far. And I'm like, y'all, like, I do work out, you know. They're like, no, Ty, like, it's way higher up than Denver when you go hiking because Denver is like the center. So when you go hiking, it's even further up. And I'm like, okay, as long as it's not me, <laughs> not me. So I only experienced it when I was hiking. But, like, I've had, you know, plenty of friends come visit me and they have said the same thing. So I would tell them, like, you know, make sure they get electrolytes because that's what like my people from church have told me. Like, make sure you just get a bunch of electrolytes and water. Got you, got you. So you go from Baltimore to Denver. You're now teaching within Denver Public Schools. Yeah. And I've never been to Denver, never taught in Denver, but I can imagine that there are very few of us in those spaces. And you had to have had some kind of culture shock. So I want to know from you, describe that experience being in Denver Public Schools and 
being one of the few black educators in that space? Because I know that was something that you had to adjust to. I mean, it was very different because, again, like I'm from Baltimore, D.C., Chocolate City, and then I attended HBCU for college. So then I come here and I'm literally back to a minority again. Like, that's the one thing, like, I don't, you know, pin people against each other. You know how, like, they say like this, black people that go to PWIs, HBCUs, go to whatever school you want to. But I always advocate for people to go to HBCUs because, like, you have your whole life to be a minority. And that became a reality for me when I was in Colorado. Like, I am so grateful to have my experience at HBCU because, yes, I go to the school and myself and there's literally were the only black people in the whole building. There were probably, like, two black kids in the whole building. So the first school I taught at was majority Hispanic area. Um, so I went there and it was just very different. Um, I'm comfortable with a lot of people. Like I can go anywhere and meet people and talk to people. Like before COVID, every year I did a solo trip by myself. Like my first solo trip ever was to Italy by myself. And I had no problems meeting people, going to events. So I've always been like very personable and I can meet anyone, but it was still just very different. And then also that's also how I started <laughs> Black University because I would be in these spaces and like, again, like I talk with my hands. Like even now I try to like put my hands down and people who are not people of color find it a little offensive or feel like I'm being aggressive. And I'm just like, I'm just trying to get my point across just like you are. Um, so within those spaces, I realized that sometimes like I felt like I was talking to a wall. Right. I kind of had to like um, limit myself and like lower myself because I felt like whenever I would speak, it wasn't actually heard or interpreted. So in my mind, I always tell my students too, like a problem without a solution is not a problem or you haven't really thought of it to find a solution. Um, so if I thought that my problem was that I felt like I couldn't really talk to these women or in this space, I need to find out who I can talk to. So when I did move to Colorado, uh, so before I moved to Colorado, my friends in Florida gave me a going away brunch. And at the brunch, one of my friend's uncle was like, Ty, I know someone in Colorado. Take her number down. And I was like, oh, okay. So I literally texted this lady when I got there and she picked me up from the airport to take me to my car because my car got shipped there. And right. she said, like, hey, you should come to church with me tomorrow because I got there on a Saturday. And I was like, okay, I'll come. So me and her went to the Potter's house, which is, this was way before Sarah Jakes and her husband. It was like this bald guy who was caught up in some scandal but she took me there the church was crazy i would never go again i was like this is crazy <laughs> but this is where like also i found a bunch of black people and then i also one of my friends from college uh went to law school there so he took me to another church the following sunday and i was like this is where all the black people are and from that church i connected with uh quincy shannon who was a dean uh academic dean in colorado and he connected me to like Jennifer Bacon and people on the school board. So I would take my issues to them because I was like, clearly like I was just talking to a brick wall there. Um, but again, like I was able to still communicate with them, but I still just felt like at the end of the day, they still didn't understand me or they didn't seek to understand me. So there was always like a divide. So I was like, you know what? I need to find a way to express myself. And my first year teaching, I was only making $21,000. So I was like, I need some more money. I need to be able to express myself. I need to find people that look like me. So that's how Black University started, honestly. Wow. Do you just say 21K? $21,000. Like I can show you my tax return. $21,000. And then at that point, you you already had your four year degree, and you were, you had some master's experience in a master's program at that time, right? Yes. Twenty one k. Okay, I just want to paint the picture for folks who just don't understand why, as educators, we we talk about just livable wages. You know, we're not we're not saying we need to be rich, but we got to be able to survive and, and take care of our families. You know, 21K is, yeah. Nothing go. like that. Now that you think it's like literally nothing. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to go into my soapbox. I want to make sure that we center <laughs> you tonight. But you mentioned something about HBCUs. And I didn't have the privilege of going to an HBCU, although I love my alma mater, Temple University, where there were a lot of black people. And it had an HBCU feel. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the great things about HBCUs that all my friends who attended them tell me is the fact that the black experience is centered. Yeah. And which so 
and that's an advantage because when you go to predominantly non-melanated spaces, <laughs> at least you have that self-image and you know who you are and you don't have to question who you are. You know, you feel confident in any space you go to because you had that experience of an HBCU. And I think that's the distinguishing factor there. But yeah, but honestly, if I was going to HBCU and I tell folks this, I feel like I would have gone to the Mecca. I feel like I would have gone to Howard. I, I, like, he's gonna say that. <laughs> I feel like a Howard person. Yeah. Whatever that means, but it's funny. If I would have stayed in Maryland, I would have went to Howard. Or, so it's funny. I never really wanted to stay in Maryland. I never even thought of it, which is funny because Maryland has really great schools. Like Morgan is like so up and developed. Like I've gone back, like my mom literally lives, owns her house down by Morgan and Morgan owns almost half the block now. Like it's like Morgantown and Morgan is a great school, but I just didn't want to go to schools in Maryland, especially because like literally Morgan is like down the street from my aunt's house. I'm like, I do not want to live that close <laughs> to my parents. Even when I went to school in Florida and I didn't know much about the schools in Florida, I ex USF out because it was literally 10 minutes from my mom. And I was like, unfortunately, I don't want to be that close to her. <laughs> but I applied to Bowie and Frostburg because Bowie is like 40 minutes from Baltimore and Frostburg too was like two hours from there. So I was like, oh, I would go to those two schools. Um, but yeah, I never <laughs> wanted to go to any, but they all are great schools. And Howard definitely, yes, is like the Mecca. <laughs> yes, it is. And uh, my second choice would have been Hampton it would have been Howard or Hampton. So some way, somehow, I'll be in a DMV area. I have friends that I met in Colorado who went to Hampton. And then I have friends who went to Howard too. My friend, um, Lauren, who's also AKA, she was like, they always go through this feud, like the real HU, like Hampton versus Howard. <laughs> no, but everybody has that claim for their HBCU. Like, oh, we're the best and... I, don't know, I just love all HBCUs. Me too. If but I could so, do it, BCU and and the fam, you definitely got. No, 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 for real. That was like a big thing in the South, and I didn't even learn much about it until. So again, I had four jobs in college. I remember walking through campus, and I seen a sign that said scholarship, and I was like, "Let me go figure out where that was," because again, I had to pay for my school. I was trying to pay for it by any means necessary. So I went, and it was like, "Oh, the sports trainer." And I was like, oh, what does this, this consist of? So it was like, you know, giving the players uh, physical therapy during the week, you know, foot games, wrapping their ankles. If they come to the sideline, you know, give them Gatorade, give them water, um, you know, stretching them before practice. And then you got to travel to all the games. And then I got a free meal plan because, again, I moved off campus, so I didn't get the meal plan anymore. So I got to get in the cafe for free. I get to travel to all the games. So I got to experience my first, like, homecoming, my first, like, classic it was lit. It's really like it. It's a. It's a thing. Like I see why in the South, like they do all that stuff because it is really a thing. I love it. <laughs> yeah, and I think that aspect of it is what I wish I was able to experience uh, during my college years. But you know, nevertheless, I'm happy with you know my college experience. But if I could do it all over again, I might have gone to an HBCU. I would have gone there for sure. But let's talk about black university. So you're in Denver. You're noticing a lot of things, not just there, but even in your travels, your solo travels. What I want to know is, and you talked about this a little bit um, earlier, what ultimately inspired you to start black university and all the other enterprises under that umbrella and what's the overarching mission of the company? So it's so funny because I've watched A Different World plenty of times as like everyone. It's like one of the black classics. But uh, three years ago when it was like, that was like the first major snowstorm I experienced in Colorado. So of course, like in Colorado, my family will always call me asking me like, is it snowing there? Is it snowing there? And ironically, it never really would be snowing whenever they would call me. And the thing is, like, it was snow in Colorado because Colorado was huge, but it wouldn't be snowing in Denver, which is in the center. But this one particular year, we got snowed in. And it was the first time in the three years I was living there that we actually didn't have school because it would be feet of snow. And 
there still will be school. Um, so we were snowed in, and this is also the first year that like Amazon started doing their like delivery, grocery delivery. Right. So my roommates and I literally we had like got a sofa couch that weekend because we used to always have friends over. And I'm like, y'all not sleeping in my bed. So we ended up getting a sofa couch. So we were on the sofa couch that whole week that we were snowed in. Well, three days. And we were watching a different world. And for some reason, like as many times as I've watched this show, for some reason this time I was like, you know what? I need to do a university for black teachers, for black educators. So I was like, you know what? Black university. And then I was like, it's a university. And of course, HBCUs, every HBCU has a Greek slogan, Greek a Latin slogan. So I was like, okay, the purpose is for me to express myself and I want other black educators to be able to express themselves. So when you express yourself, you're free. So I'm like looking up quotes about freedom, free quotes. So like the Latin slogan, is a quote by Langston Hughes. Like, when I discover who I am, then I'll be free. Because mm. I, I feel like I'm always on a journey of discovery, which is ironically, I published a journal this year on Amazon, which is called Journey of Discovery. And but before I did that, I didn't think that it connected. But I'm just like, discovering yourself, because in this, like, you talk about self-identity and identity for teachers. Like, you have to be true to who you are and identify yourself in order to embrace your students and allow them to be unique in their own walk and their own journey. So I was like, you know what? I need to create something for teachers and other people that look like me. So first it started with the pearl. So that's how Black University started. And I was like, oh, you know, I wanted to be like a different world. So like the first shirt I came out was like that granite font because it had like the different world feel. Um, and like every collection was named after a book written by a black author. Like it was just black, black, black. Like I'm here for everybody, all allies. But I'm like, I'm a black woman first. Like I do not like when people say I don't see color. Because I'm like, if you don't see color, you truly don't see me. You can see me, but don't treat me differently because of who I am. But so I just wanted it to be like a pearl. But then I, my friends in Colorado also was like, you know, we like your stuff. But they also was trying to figure out with other people that look like them were, especially in education. So I was like, you know what? I just start hosting some events for Black educators. So that's how Black Educators Connect page started. So I started Black Educators Connect with my friend Marissa, um, and we hosted a few events in Colorado. So we hosted a brunch, we hosted like a yoga event, because I wanted it to be like events to connect people. But then of course, like self-care, I'm like, as a teacher, I burnt myself out my first year teaching and I vowed to never do that again. So I was like, I want my events to focus on self-care more than like academia because I'm like, you get a lot of training in school. I didn't want to be the person to offer that, unfortunately. So we hosted like self-care events and things of that nature. But then of course, like I graduated and then I moved across town and COVID. So I haven't hosted any event. And then like I didn't expect the page to get as big as it is now. So now I'm going back and reevaluating like what's the ultimate goal, the ultimate mission for this? Um, because the goal was for me to just connect with other people that look like me and allow them to find other people too within their communities that they may have not known so they can grow and connect together within the education field. And I'm so glad that you mentioned this whole idea of reevaluation because a lot of people, especially on Instagram or Twitter, they get so focused on the statistics and the numbers, they don't realize the work that happens behind the scenes. They don't realize the fact that we all have imperfections as we grow. And, and I tell people all the time, you know, I'm still growing in my journey. You know, I watch people like yourself and so many others. And I'm like, you know what? I like how they're doing, you know, this aspect. Let me, let me take that and remix it to make it fit what I'm trying to do. And, and it's a learning experience. And and I think uh, when we talk about just this idea of entrepreneurship, I don't think people realize the amount of work that's put into this. And as somebody who understands what it means to hustle, you know, having four jobs during college and then, you know, going off to to start this business venture that is doing very well and is still growing. I mean, what are what are some things that you would tell folks who are interested in getting into entrepreneurship, starting their own thing, but they just need that extra nudge to to take that leap of faith? I think you really have to start with your story and start with your why. And I know a lot of people say this, and there's even a book called Start With Your Why. Like, it's literally true. Like, the reason why I started Black University is because 
I didn't have any people that look like me. And I also didn't have the money to basically support myself. So I had to find that solution. I needed to support myself. I needed to find people that look like me. And because, again, I'm a natural people person. I'm a natural problem solver. I also didn't want it to just be about me. So I was like, I know I can't be the only one having this issue or having this problem of being like one of few or the only black person in their profession. So I was like, I need to be able to connect with other people that look like me. So you literally have to start with your why and start with your story and go there. So start with your life, start with your story and figure out what exactly it is that you want to do. Because again, while social media is a gift and a curse, I always say, like a lot of people get on social media and want to mimic what someone else is doing. And there's difference between like inspiration and like copying or mimicking something. Like you have to do things that are true to you. So like get your inspiration because everything that has been done you know, it's from somewhere else, but they've tweaked it or made it their own. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel, but you do have to make sure you know what you want to do and stay true to that because you don't want to be trying to do everything that other people do because you will lack like your own personal brand, your own personal vision, and people won't really connect to what exactly it is that you want to do because you're going to be all over the place. So first I would say like start with your story because your story is what's going to connect people to you. And then tailor that down to your exact niche. Like, who are your target market? Who are those people that you're trying to target? Yes. Unfortunately, you cannot target and service everybody. Like I said, like, I'm for all people, and I'm here for all allies and people that support me. But I made it clear when I started my brand that I'm for Black educators and people of color. And that's not to admit anybody else. Like, I've had other people who are not people of color attend my events. They buy my apparel, but everything is tailored to black educators between the ages of 18 and 35 that live in metropolitan cities. Like you literally got to get very succinct with who you're trying to target. You like, you need to think of an avatar. So when I started my business, I had to come up with the avatar and my uh, mentor just at the time, or her Instagram is Irregular Jazz. She helped me with this. You need to think of a person, give them a trait. How much do they make? Where do they live? What are their hobbies? So my person was Erica. Erica made $55,000 a year. She lived in Atlanta. She was a, a teacher. She was an HBCU graduate. She, you know, goes to happy hours. She goes to homecoming. So she likes to wear her shirts when she's teaching. She likes to wear her shirts when she goes to homecoming. She likes to practice self-care on the weekends, and she likes to have drinks with her friends. So you are making a pearl for that person. So you need to start with your brand, your story, which is going to lead to your brand story. Think about your target niche and come up with a customer avatar. And all that is important. And and you mentioned something interesting because there are a lot of people who, who clout chase. You know, and you were very generous when you said copying, but I mean, ultimately it's kind of like, okay, I'm just trying to get these follows. I'm trying to get that 10K so I can get yeah. the swipe up. I didn't even, so I didn't even realize like once Black Educators Connect like got past 10K that you even had the swipe up feature. Like I was talking to one of my friends from college and it was like, yo, I love what you're doing Black University. And I'm like, I'm not doing anything. They're like, no, man, you know, you got the swipe up feature too now on your Instagram so you can add this. And I'm like, what? I could do what? Like, honestly, I didn't even know until they told me. So I'm like, it's all just like, I mean, it's a part of the process. Like I, like I say, social media is a gift and a curse. Like I said, once I get to the point, I want to pay somebody to do it for me because I just don't, it's, it's just too much. But the one thing that too, like you said in the beginning, like following people who inspire you, because I know it's like sometimes the feed just gets too clustered with stuff that I just don't want to see. And people that, right. just, people that just don't give me the right energy. And I don't like that. And like, as soon as I stroll, I'm just like, I want to get off. So like following people that actually like give you that positive energy and radiate positivity and uniqueness. I enjoy that. No, exactly. And, you know, we're at a place now especially in the IG space, the IG educator space, where it's becoming oversaturated with a lot of the the same things. Yeah. Which what which is why it's important for us to really define our story as you mentioned, but also have the consistency because I mean ultimately anybody can go ahead and just make t-shirts. Anybody can go ahead and write a book. Anybody can go ahead and, and start a business. But if your message isn't clear to your your niche or your target audience, that's going to inform your messaging. Mm -hmm. So like when I go on your page, I know it's going to be about self-care. I know it's going to be about self-empowerment. I know it's going to be about everything black. 
because you're consistent with that. That's who you are. I try. I try. You know, like I don't have to guess what the platform is about. And we can get to that point. That's just huge because then people will will come and say, like, wow, you know, like Tashia, I, I love what you're doing with this platform. I love how you do the self-care and you do the, the videos and, and everything and you're able to bring other people onto the platform. And I think when you're able to do that, that's what that's what brings more people on as opposed to focusing on that 10K number. Like the fact that you didn't focus on that is what allows you to stay focused because you are focused on the content. You know what I mean? So so kudos to you for that. Kudos to you. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. But but let's talk about self-care for a second. We we need some self-care, especially during COVID-19. And I know you're really big on self-care. And I don't know if we can narrow it down to three tips, but what are your favorite tips for teachers who are looking to exercise that self-care during this pandemic because i mean teachers are struggling right now and you know they, they need some love you know we need some love right now well first like my shirt that's where i started this it, like a crossed out on like lesson planning observation team meeting self-care because like unfortunately you can't do anything if you don't take care of yourself and then i know self-care is like this fetish word on social media but it's truly important and the reason why i became a self-care advocate is because i burnt myself out my first year teaching like i woke up on a saturday racing to school didn't realize it was saturday like i don't know what didn't register but between getting up getting dressed driving to school until i actually got there and my mom was like, you're losing it. Because unfortunately, as much as we care for this profession, which is why I do applaud teachers for good trouble, they will replace you in a heartbeat. And also, like, if you're not tending to yourself, you can't service your students. So you can think about it in the fact that, like, a lot of people feel guilty for taking time for themselves. But think of it as if, like, you want to be so much for your students because you know the impact that it will have on them. But you can't impact them if you're not well. So that's the first thing. Like, think about it as it's like, you're able to service so and so because you're taking care of yourself. Like I started doing this, I started a pledge on Friday, so I'll start doing it every Friday. It literally was like, I am cert I can do this for myself because it benefits blank. So the person can put in who it benefits. So taking care of yourself benefits who? It benefits your children. It benefits your students. Why does it benefit them? Because you're able to have energy. You're able to service them, but you service yourself first. So I always say like empty light doesn't provide any any sunshine you have to tend to yourself so think of it as like you are sending to yourself and that you're able to service them Two, find things that you truly like and truly enjoy and do those things um like it doesn't have to be anything extravagant and also it's going to look differently like self-care is not a one-time thing or one thing that you just do right it's it's literally listening to whatever your mind, body, and soul are telling you they need. So, like, some days I do need a bubble. Like, people on social media, like, this, this, but whatever. You Sometimes it is bubble bath and wine. And sometimes it is a pedicure because, like, tomorrow I'm definitely going to get me a pedicure because I need one. And I need to relax. But sometimes it's sleeping. Sometimes it's meditating. Sometimes it's working out. So it's literally listening to whatever your mind, body, and soul are telling you they need. But also find a hobby or something that, like, brings out the creative side of you that doesn't involve teaching or it may align to teaching. So for me, it was my apparel, which it just so happens to align to teaching because it services educators. But I'm able to do my own designs and work on them and of course make some money. So find a craft or a hobby or something that do outside of teaching to also like just have that like releasing moment. Cause like when I'm making shirts and I'm in my zone, like I'm not really focused on anything but making the shirts. So those would be my tips. <laughs> right. And with the shirts, when you come up with a design, does it just happen when you're taking a walk or you're just sleeping? Because that tends to happen to me a lot when I come up with a, a dope idea like, oh, wow. And you wake up at two in the morning, you kind of write in your little, you write in your um your journal, come back to it at eight in the morning. Okay, I got something here. <laughs> <laughs> so it's funny, mine only come, well, lately... 
it has been like that. But when I first started, it just came out uh, based on like the things that I wanted to do or like the things that uh, expressed me at the time. And also again, because I was like, you know, when I started, which it still does, but when I started, it was like, I wanted to be black everything. So when I thought of the slogan, it was a slogan from Langston Hughes and you know, Langston Hughes is an author. So I was like, you know what? It'd be dope if I did the collection based off black authors and I started a black book club. So I was like, you know, every collection is going to be named after a book written by a black author and the shirts are going to be a representation of whatever the overarching theme of the book is. So the first book we did was Stereotype by an author named Vic Breedy. Um, and in the book, it talks about there's one thing to be stereotyped, but there's one thing to internalize those stereotypes and what happens when you internalize those stereotypes. So all the shirts were a contrast to stereotypes. So this was like, that's when I first came out with my classic Black Women Teach, Black Men Teach, because it's a stereotype that we don't teach. And it's like, we do teach, we are here. So it's like, define that stereotype. Um, and then the next book was, it was four of them. Look, I can't even think of the book. It was um, Rise and Grind by Damon John. So all the books had, to, the book deals with like, the way that you grind and how you can take tips from other people who are successful. So all the books, all the shirts had to do with the book. Um, so I came up with different things off of that. But then also, again, you know, trying to save the times but not trying to mimic anybody. You also have to stay trendy because I am trying to service 18 and 35 year olds, which are millennials. So we are like trendy people. So over time, I stopped really focusing on the book aspect of it and focus on like, the trend or like topics in the media. So like the last couple of shirts were based on like what were trending or what people were telling me they needed. So the main thing was self care too. So I was like, oh, I needed to come out with self care idea. And then I also paid attention to like the holidays. Um, so October 1st, I believe is like National Coffee Day. So I was like, you know what, I need to come out with a coffee collection. And then I'm like, but it needs to align. It still needs to align to what I do. Like, I'm not just going to come out with a shirt and it doesn't align to anything. So it needs to be coffee and culture. So I was like, you know what, let me think of some ideas. And it needs to be black, uh, black everything. So I just, it just, that's how it works. I don't know. And then, yes, I like jot down. I have a whole like notepad in my uh phone and i email it to myself like every couple days so i'm like just in case my phone just shuts off one day i got it in my email got it on my flash drive like i literally be putting in my notepad like different ideas but again like i don't know one thing like you do want to steal your ideas but you don't want to steal your ideas and i also don't want to just be putting out stuff be putting out stuff so i like kind of categorize stuff and figure out when i actually want to do it but yes <laughs> no no and i think everybody has their own process. I know for myself, like I have a memo, I have a whole memo pad, you know, on my phone. So whenever I'm out and I can't write it in my book, I go to my memo sheet and just type in things. So I have a list for books I want to read. I have a list of just ideas. I even have a list of guests that I would like to have on the show. Like I have a list for everything <laughs> and I just put it on this sheet. So it's just crazy how, everybody has their own process of, of operating when it comes to idea and content um, creation. So that's interesting. Yeah, but what's I gonna say? So we have all this going on and you're still standing. You're still standing. No, you're still grinding. That's, that's the crazy part. I, I, where do you find the time to, to get rest? Listen, I just told my uh, my assistant director the other day that I put, I put I needed a day off, and she was like, and it's funny because she's like, mm, that's gonna be a tough one, and I didn't even say anything. It's but I like sometimes like my my face says it all, but I literally had like a blank facial expression, and she probably could tell. And she's like, you know, let me see what I. She's like, let me go talk to so and so, and she literally came back like five minutes later, like, yeah, it's fine. And I'm like, yeah, it's gonna be fine because I wasn't gonna come. Unfortunately, like I was on the courtesy letting you know because I was like, that's gonna be a day that I don't do anything, like literally, because after my first year teaching. My, like when I ran myself dry, my second year teaching, I love my principal at that school. Like she's literally like my reference letter for like all my jobs, even the school I'm teaching at now. Because she came around asking everyone like, do you need to take a mental health day? Do you need to take a mental health day? And I was like, what? And she's like, you know, just a day for yourself. Because like even in the black community, like I grew up with a single mom and like, 
you know, moms, you know, they do so much for their children and everything, which I applaud, but it's like they never take time for themselves. And like we have sick days and vacation days at work. And unfortunately, we also only use those days when we're actually sick or actually on vacation. But it's like, no, use a day when you just don't have to do anything. Because I'm noticing that even when I have vacation days or sick days, like I'm actually, yeah, sick or vacationing. And I'm just like, no, I need days where I'm actually just not doing anything. So like, yeah, I'm having a day next week where I'm not going to work. But also, like, I set time limits because, unfortunately, I'm at work. Now my schedule has changed. I am I teach 6.45 to 3.45. Um, it was 8 to 5 at first. But, like, after I get off of work, I come home and I walk the dog. You know, I eat dinner with my boyfriend and, like, we watch TV together. And then I go to sleep. And then also, like, you know, I make time to check my phone and make sure, like, Black Educate Connect is um, set. But I get off of social media at 9 o'clock. Like, if I haven't done everything by 9 o'clock, then I'm just not doing it until the morning. Um, so I set those boundaries. And then on the weekends, like, you cannot call me, text me, or anything about school. Like, I, I'm sorry. There's nothing that is that major that you have to call me and text me on the weekend. Like, No. So, like, this shirt says, like, on the weekends, like, especially because those are the days where I literally have to go to school or work, you can't call me text me about school at all. I'm not checking my phone, email. And that's why, like, I pick a day. Well, with preschool is a little different. I mean, I still have the lesson plan, but it's not as extensive as when I taught, like, third, fourth, and fifth grade. But even still, like, I find one day during the week where I just plan for the whole week. Like, today, I literally plan up until uh, Christmas and we're only off Christmas day, but I planned all the way up until then. So I don't have to take extra time after work or, or even on my lunch break to do that. So like on my lunch breaks, I take a nap too. So my lunch breaks, I take a nap. When I get home, I prioritize like my family. I make sure that my social media and stuff is handled. Cause again, social media is a gift in the kids, which is not to work it. Um, and then I set those limits to be on social media at nine o'clock. And then on the weekends, you cannot contact me about school on Saturdays, depending on the Saturday, um, unfortunately I have a funeral to go to this Saturday, but on Saturdays, I literally will sleep in till like 10. Like, of course my body naturally wakes up 6am, but I still will stay in the bed till like 10, mm -hmm. make myself breakfast, or I might go out to breakfast. Cause again, self-care is listening to what your mind, body, and soul tell you and eat. My mind is telling me that I need to stay in this bed because I've been out this bed at 6am every day. And then it's also telling me like, Ooh, some good yummy breakfast will be good, but you know, you don't feel like cooking. So let me go to get me some breakfast. Oh, and I'm in Baltimore. So there's a lot of black businesses. Let me go support a black business too and let me take a mindfulness walk while I'm at it and I'm just gonna come home and just lie gag the whole day and then Sunday okay we gotta get ready for school but you still can stay in the bed till about 10 put your clothes in the washer put something in the crock pot and still go about your day so yes <laughs> no and I'm glad you mentioned the importance of having boundaries and also having discipline too because you can say or schedule times where you're going to do this and that, but you still have to follow it. Yeah. And I know there are many times where I've scheduled the day and I'll, and I'll tell myself, okay, for these, for this two hour block, I'm doing everything, just social media. I'm going to get my post in, schedule them. But then you find yourself at 11 still scheduling posts. Like, nope, that's not what the plan was. Now, what am I, what am I doing? It doesn't go straight, but like your horse, you have your track record just has to be more good than bad. Like every day doesn't go like that. Some days I am still on my phone at 10 o'clock because I was like either still having dinner with my family or getting home late too. So I'm just like, okay, I have to get on here, you know, but just more times not doing that. <laughs> no, that's, that's real talk. That's real talk. And then just shout out to Vic Breedy, who is from Boston. <laughs> um, and she is a phenomenal author so make sure you check out uh, Stereotype which is a dope book I actually have the book as well so it's in my library <laughs> alright so we're winding down so let's go into the lightning round so you've already received the questions so none of these questions should be surprises <laughs> uh, so Let's start off by asking you, what is your favorite self-care activity? Sleeping. <laughs> I know that's right. <laughs> Sleeping. Like I told you, I literally will, I will 
take a nap on my lunch break. Like today, I took half an hour. La- I was like, okay, I'm going to take a nap half hour. And then the other half hour, I eat and do some other social media stuff. And that was it. And then when I come home, I look forward to sleeping. I have a nice, comfortable bed. And it's warm because it's cold outside now, too. Sleeping. <laughs> Listen, sleeping is underrated. Very. Like, I, I love Eric Thomas and everybody else. But I'm gonna get my sleep in now. I get what he's saying. You only, I, I don't think you need eight hours of sleep now. I, but I have to at least get a minimum of six. I know this myself. Like at least five to six are my good. Like I feel like when I get eight, it's too much. Like I wake up tired. When I get six, five to six, I'm good. But I definitely gotta get my sleep in. I'm not one of those people that say hashtag no sleep. Mm-mm. Not this. <laughs> yeah. I think that's the average sleeping duration for for teachers in general like if you get five six hours you can function fairly well yes you won't be perfect but you'll be able to function yeah six hours yeah i mean i believe that even though people say you got to get a minimum of eight like eight's the minimum yeah uh, i mean that's it's hard these days because my my mind and my body's wired to wake up early even when i don't want to that is <laughs> Sure. That's like on the weekends, I was like, I will stay in the bed till 10. I might not be asleep, but I'm just going to stay because my body literally still wakes up 6 o'clock. And I'm like, yo, go back to sleep. You don't have nowhere to go. <laughs> nah, that's real. That's definitely real. Now, if you can invite three influential figures to dinner, dead or alive, who would those three people be? Tupac, Michael Jackson. And Robert Smith. So Tupac, because although he's from New York, he reps Baltimore. Yes. And my mom went to school with him and Jada Pinkett Smith. And he's just like poetic. Like I just vibe with him. He's full of black people. He didn't have no issues being the person that spoke out. And I never had an issue being the person that spoke out. He was just that person for me. Uh, Michael Jackson, because I love his music. And of course, like his music lives on. But he was just... He's probably the most influential person I've ever like seen on like the artistry field. Like everyone was probably influenced by Michael Jackson. And then Robert Smith, because he's like the top, the number one black billionaire. Um, and he has like so many investments. And of course he's like, he invests in community and he advocates for like black issues. But so those three people. Awesome. So as you know, and everybody else knows, we have a change in the guard at the White House and educators are ecstatic because there is hope. (laughs) So I want to know from you, if you can talk to President-elect Biden, what would you tell him um, that the number one issue should be? within the first 100 days he's in office in terms of education, what should be that number one issue he should focus on if you could talk to him? I still have to think about this, and I don't think my answer is, like, concrete. Because, again, I would my first thing was, like, student loans, student loans, student loans. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think they could do that in 100 days. But you know what, honestly, you know, I don't even want to say they can't because, unfortunately, the United States has really started to get on my nerves because as it boils down, like, the wealthy people have always benefited in this country. Um, like there is wealthy people who don't pay taxes. And that's why like people have an issue like, no, if you borrow money, you should pay your student loans back. And I'm like, there's billionaires out here not paying taxes. There's nothing to for them to forgive people's loans. Again, and then people who are not using that money to pay their loans, they're gonna just put it back in the economy anyway. So I honestly feel like student loans should be wiped out for teachers and healthcare workers because they, although they say like, there's all oh, the student loan forgiveness process, the student loan forgiveness process is bull crap because I actually like read when I started, you know, teaching my first year, I was like, oh yeah, let me go see what this is about. You know, you're teaching, you know, culturally urban area, but it's like, you have to teach in like these areas. And if you teach elementary school, which I do, you have to teach for five years. And after five years, you get $5,000. I'm like, you probably have spent more than that of your own money within five year time. If you teach middle school, high school, you get fifteen thousand dollars towards your loans. But you it still it has it repeats every five years or something like that. But it just was like 
it didn't seem beneficial to me. It's like, it doesn't actually wipe it out. And you still have to devote all this time to put into, which you probably spent more of your own money before they actually paid that. And then you still had to make a hundred payments on your student loans. And even if you paid $20, you still had to make a hundred separate $20 payments too. And I was just like, it was just too many stipulations. And I'm just like, yo, you wouldn't even do what I'm doing. So how are you making all these stipulations on this? And the people who make these rules for student loans have never even taught a day in their lives. Talk so about I it. I think that it literally should be student loan forgiveness. Like, wipe it out. Like, just start over. <laughs> but, but do you see the design and all that? Do you see why they say you need to teach at a Title I school in yeah. a low-income neighborhood? Yeah. Because they know themselves that they couldn't do it for five years in a row. Exactly. And they know that themselves. And you still want me to make payments on my student loans while I'm already not making that much money. Like, that alone. Make it make sense. It right. Don't make make sense. it make sense, right? <laughs> that, in a nutshell, lets them know that, hey, we are essential workers. Because guess what? If this thing was easy... Everybody and their mama would be doing it. Exactly. Real talk. So last question. 2020 is coming to a close. I want you to give us three words to describe your 2020. Oh, my gosh. I still didn't really think about this when you sent me the question. But I think it was jump, stay, and work. So it was jump because I had to do a lot of transitions this year. So, of course, like literally J January 1st this year, I launched a journal on Amazon. And I was like, oh, I didn't know. But I started, you know, journaling for my own practice. So on my personal page, I always talk about journaling. And, you know, I was doing my videos. And I always say, you know, click the link in my bio, get my journal. But I was really journaling and working on myself because a part of me, like, taking care of myself and catering to my self-care was also journaling my emotions because although I, I, I'm a very positive person and people applaud me on that, I had a lot of eternal issues, especially like family issues. And I had a hard time like talking to people, but I found it peaceful and releasing and therapeutic to journal about it. So I published a journal. Um, also faith because Faith without work is dead, but faith because I knew that like God would guide me ultimately to where I needed to be. And like I didn't live home. I haven't lived home in nine years. So I took that leap and that jump and came home after nine years. And honestly, like mentally wise, it's been the most liberating I've been. So I think it's been those words. <laughs> yeah, see, you answered it perfectly. In a way that makes sense to you. So yeah, you're good. Oh, you're good. There's no wrong answers here. Ah, but Tashia, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me. This has just been a dope conversation. Thanks. Um, and I'm pretty sure this won't be the last. Of course not. <laughs> yes. Uh, but let people know how they can connect with you because people need to get on your platform. People need to know all this work you're doing with um, Black University, Black Educators, Connect, the Apparel Line. So let them know how they can connect on social media. So you can follow me on Instagram, all three pages. <laughs> At the Millennial Educator, so that's Millennial with one N, because unfortunately somebody had the Millennial with two N, so now I'm just going to staple Millennial with one N, and even like when I'm typing it in on things, it like always like underscores it, and I'm like, I know, it does have two Ns, but my personal page is at the Millennial Educator, because I always say like, I'm a whole person outside of teaching, like, although I advocate for education, and I'm a teacher by trade, like, I am a whole millennial. I'm still trying to figure out life. Like, I'm still in my 20s. So on my personal page, you will find self-care, me being me, and, like, motivation. And then there's Black Educators Connect, where I post all things Black education, Black self-care, and culture. And then there's the Black Educators Apparel page, which just features all of our apparel. And there it is. Make sure you follow all three of those accounts. <laughs> all three of them. All three of them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Tashia, thank you so much. Thank you. And hope you have a great night and happy holidays to you. Yes, happy holidays to you and your family. Dad, yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> All right, y'all. So that is a wrap. Another episode of my Dane Talk for Educators Live coming to a close. So as we always say, 
We wish you a good morning, good afternoon, good night, wherever you are in the world. And we're going to do this again another time. Peace out, everybody.